Today, I'm going to be speaking with Max Burns, who's an award winning Democratic strategist and also founder of Third Degree Strategies. Max recently wrote an article asserting that we may we may finally be at a tipping point when it comes to gun violence and gun safety in the United States. We're going to talk about that. Max, great to have you on. I appreciate it. Thanks so much for having me. So, I mean, listen, my audience knows we've heard this so many times before this. This is definitely a tipping point. You know, Sandy Hook was a tipping point or Pulse nightclub or whatever else the case may be. Even popular reforms like uh, a background check as a requirement for any gun transaction, including private person to person sales. Very popular with the American public after Sandy Hook can't get it done. So I think people would be right to be skeptical that we are now at a tipping point. So lay lay it out for us. Why now? What has changed? Well, you're absolutely right. I think the the gun violence conversation has been one that's been littered with disappointments from the beginning. Uh, But what we're seeing now is a really interesting confluence of factors. One is that even though Congress is essentially useless on gun policy right now, we're seeing a real golden age of Democratic lawmakers in states passing legislation that would have been unimaginable even a few years ago. Gretchen Whitmer, for example, uh, just passed an 11-bill gun reform package. That would have ended her career back in 2008. Now they're talking about her as a potential candidate for president. The other side of this is the NRA. They are in free fall. And what was once the biggest gun rights group in America can now barely afford to keep the lights on in its office, much less fund the candidates that have distorted this conversation for decades. So there's this this unique window of weakness on the right and strength on the left that's really creating a unique space for a gun conversation that leads to actual legislation. I think a couple of the difficulties are, and part of this relates to what is or could be done at the federal level and what is or could be done at the state level. A lot of this right now, for example, when you talk about the Gretchen Whitmer package, We're talking about the state level. And here there's a sort of like moral hazard situation where the states most willing to deal with this stuff often are the ones that already are kind of ahead on the stricter side when it comes to gun safety as it is. So then when we think about, well, how do we deal with this issue in South Carolina or Texas? We start to think federally. And one of the difficulties about federal gun safety legislation is that running on it for national candidates often isn't a great idea from a strategy perspective, which I would be glad to let you speak to as well. But we there's this idea and maybe it's true, maybe it's not that when you run national campaigns, including for like Senate, right, because you're in D.C., but your constituents are in your state, that when you talk about gun safety regulations, you rarely bring new voters to support you, but you often activate people who disagree with you. And so there's that difficulty of saying, well, the way to get Texas and West Virginia and South Carolina to do something is to go federal, but campaigning on this stuff federally often backfires. So how do you do that? Yeah, I think that's a great point. And one of the interesting challenges here is that for years, Democrats were sort of bought into this Republican message that it was political suicide to talk about guns in a campaign. Right. I remember following the Virginia Tech shooting, Democrats came out the day after to publicly reassure America that they wouldn't dream of passing any gun control legislation. (laughs) Uh, And now those same people are leading major campaigns uh, in states and federally on gun reform. And that's in large part due to the rise of groups like Every Town, Moms Demand Action, uh, these new groups that have sort of adopted the rights organizing approach for this. And we see that now that the majority of Americans have in some way been touched by gun violence, Uh, Numbers in support of gun reform are at record highs, and we're seeing that really start to break down the old coalition. In Tennessee, the Republican Governor Lee uh, is supporting red flag legislation. In Utah, uh, the Republican governor alongside every town passed a bunch of gun reforms that make it tougher to get a gun and require background checks. Uh, That's a coalition that was unimaginable even a few years ago that Republicans are seeing the pressure mount and actually realizing it's safer to take incremental gun safety steps. This is a a completely different landscape than I think Republicans are used to playing in. And it's one where Democrats can actually talk about guns 
and find that people are agreeing with them for the first time since 1994. What is the timeline on which you think we could see action on some of these areas? I think it's much quicker than than we think. If we're looking at states, the more that we've organized, and this is a really key part of every town, is they are funding state races. They're cheaper. They have a bigger impact on actual legislation. And we're seeing that start to create a momentum for national change. Once red states, which are disproportionately affected by gun violence, have seen that these things work, they're actually pretty excited to talk about them. And that's something that we're seeing distorted by the gun lobby. But when voters go to the polls, they are voting on this issue. It's a big reason why you see Joe Biden has gone from saying he won't talk about social issues at all in 2024 to opening with a, an ad that talks heavily about gun violence. Democrats can see it's a winning issue and they're for once really finding their voice here. We have in the United States sort of three separate gun issues. You have mass shootings, you have individual homicides affecting one or two individuals per incident. And then you have suicides using firearms in thinking about and the, the, the prescriptions would be different for these three different categories. If we think about mass shootings for a moment, um, I've put out a list of 10 or 12 different ideas that would never eliminate every mass shooting, but would certainly do something to reduce the number. And there are some trends that we see when it comes to the mass shootings, age of the shooter, typically under 25 type of firearm used often an assault style rifle. You know, there's these trends that we start to see. What's yep. the lowest hanging fruit in your mind that would blend the most effective changes that could be made with ones that are most likely to actually be politically viable? Well, I think there's this unique moment here that we see with Tennessee, with Utah, with North Dakota that's talking about raising the age for gun ownership, uh, that you combine background checks, which we've seen even in, in Michigan, was a hugely popular thing. Universal background check used to be a consensus Republican position in the Bush administration. Uh, they have gone so far off on that that it, it doesn't resemble anything Americans want. But you combine that background check legislation and red flag legislation, and you have immediately handled two of the most vulnerable populations, people who are going to use their guns for violence against others knowingly uh, at the time they buy the gun, and people who are going to use it for self-harm, disproportionately young people, and in rural communities, in agricultural communities, huge rates of gun suicide. And it all has to do with gun access. And we can talk about making sure guns aren't in the hands of kids without talking about uh, these Republican conspiracies of stealing everyone's guns away. And we're finding that the space for that conversation is getting bigger every year. When it comes to the next um, what's remaining, I guess I would say, of the Biden first term. And, you know, we'll see if w whether there's a second term and sort of what framing he uses for, for the 2024 campaign, given the circumstances in, in the House and Senate, Republicans controlling the House, uh, Democrats controlling the Senate at this point. What's your sense of at the federal level? What might be possible? You know, I understand you're saying that Senate Republican, I'm sorry, that state Republicans to some degree uh, seem more willing to take action. What about things that would have to go through the House and Senate? So that's the really big sticking point here is that Republicans have already said that the bipartisan gun bill that they gave Joe Biden is it for them. They mm. do not want any more. So it's going to be basically a status quo situation until voters in 2024 can be heard. Yeah. And one of the reassuring things we're seeing is that just in the same way that Beltway consultants said, don't talk about abortion in 2022, it'll be polarizing. But that turned out to be one of the leading issues for voters. Uh, we're seeing the same thing now with guns. And it's one reason why Joe Biden, who is, as I'm sure you would agree, very risk averse, is comfortable opening his reelection campaign talking about gun violence. Do you have any insights? And this is getting very specific now. You know, there's something we can look at the gun safety issue, mental health, video games, all the stuff that is always thrown around. But there is something intangible, maybe, about American gun, gun culture that doesn't exist in some of the other countries with relatively high rates of gun ownership, wherein 
I don't know. It's just sort of like it's more common in the U.S. that someone would see firearms as a way to solve a personal problem, an interpersonal problem, a societal problem. That doesn't seem to be the case in many other countries. Is there anything that can be done to restructure that relationship between Americans and guns, which seems to be sort of like a, a layer that's above all the policy that could be put in place? There is. I mean, it's fundamentally a constitutional issue. I'm old enough to remember when people were blaming video games for violence. But the problem has always been that guns in this country often have more rights than the people they're killing. And the fact is, the, the position has moved to such a maximalist one on the right that doesn't reflect anything even a few years ago that the court held uh, on guns. There's now essentially Republicans arguing for an unlimited right to own any gun that you want. And they're saying that anyone, even Republicans who propose common sense limits, are against democracy and against the Constitution. And it's polarizing people to violence. Because when you're told your fundamental rights are being taken by a tyrannical government, that justifies almost anything in order to protect your rights. And we're seeing that happen. I mean, we're seeing former MAGA voters in Nevada who shot at elected officials they thought were stealing an election. Uh, until the Supreme Court or Congress gets some constitutional momentum to rethink the madness of our current interpretation of the Second Amendment, it's tough to get anything long term accomplished. Last thing I want to ask you about, I have heard from many uh, progressives, including friends of mine, but also people who just call into my show who express views very similar to mine on the issue of gun safety and, and what they would like to see, but also don't like the idea of the right wingers being the only ones with the guns. And so they have armed themselves, particularly in the last few years. They have become progressive gun owners, gladly willing to subject themselves to background check, mental health eval, liability insurance, all the things we would want to put in. But they don't like the idea of the right wingers being the ones who disproportionately have the guns. Have you seen this? Have you heard it? Is it a race to the bottom or a logical reaction to what we're seeing out in the world? Oh, I've absolutely heard it. In fact, I believe the fastest growing group of gun owners is black women. Mm. And they're doing this in response to the increasing racial polarization and race baiting on the right. And I'll tell you, one thing that is sure to get us into the courts is the idea of black people owning guns is not something Republicans consider to be the Second Amendment. We saw that with Philando Castile, who was an NRA member that they did not stand up for at all. Uh, the quickest way that we can get to a meaningful gun reform conversation is for Republicans to get scared at all of the non-Republicans who are buying guns. Mm. But it's, a, I, to me, a completely rational response, and it's a sign of government policy failure, that people feel the need to have multiple guns to protect themselves from their own government's inability to act to protect them, that we should be ashamed of that. We are going to link to Max's piece about this issue. We've been speaking with Max Burns, who's a Democratic strategist and also founder of Third Degree Strategies. Max, really appreciate your time and insights today. Thank you so much.